All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome to episode 13 of Logic Live. This is Resolve for Flame Artists with David Johns. As always, uh, Logic Live is brought to us by Cinesis Oceana. Uh, Cinesis is my reseller. They uh, have been working with them for, for 15 years, but could not do uh, what I do. We cannot do what we do without them. And uh, they've always been huge supporters of the Flame community. They sponsor user groups all over North America. Uh, they've always sponsored the One Frame of White contests, and I just want to thank them for their continued support of the Flame community. Synesis Oceana solutions, integration, and support for digital content creators. Find out more about them at synesis.io. Synesis Oceana, supporting Flame artists since 1997. All right, so we got a, a great episode of Logic Live lined up for you today. Uh, we all know about Resolve. We've all heard of Resolve. Many of us have used Resolve. Um, and uh, I know as a, as a flame artist, I've uh, from time to time uh, needed to go and use Resolve to either, uh, I've, I mean, obviously for color grading, but also for things like uh, cleaning up XMLs, uh, which occasionally come uh, to us from our editorial friends with a couple of three, you know, issues uh, every now and then. Uh, we've also used it for uh, format conversions for, you know, either things that aren't supported yet, or maybe if you're running on an older version of flame and there's a codec that, uh, that isn't there. You could always jump into Resolve, but there's so much more to Resolve. And, uh, you know, it's, look, it's another uh, highly complex um, gray, predominantly gray visual effects app with lots of buttons. Uh, but there are, there are ways to load clips. You know, there, once you know how to load a clip and uh, figure out where a timeline is and uh, set a keyframe and, and do the basic function uh, basic functions that we as flame artists need to, you know, do every day, uh, then it's really uh, easy to pick up something uh, as complex as Resolve. And that's why I'm so excited for David to be here. Uh, I've had a chance to work with David over the, over the last year, and he's just a phenomenal guy. Uh, I'm going to put in the chat, David has a 20-minute uh, Resolve Fusion Flame Nuke uh, AE Hack workflow, basically a bit more in-depth into the how to uh, uh, integrate um, resolve into your workflow and how to go back and forth between the apps a little bit more in depth than, than, than we're, we're going to have time to get into today because we're going to cover a lot of things today. So I'll put the link for this in the chat. Definitely check it out. It's fantastic. And I would like to now welcome to Logic Live, David Johns. David. Hello, everyone. Hey, welcome, Hi. man. And you are coming to us live from Portland, Oregon, right? Is That's it Oregon correct. or Oregon? Oregon or Oregon? Gun, Oregon. Oregon, thank you. Okay, that at least if nothing else, we've settled that today. Well, the problem is there's an actual town in Wisconsin that goes by Oregon. So people learn it, especially in the Midwest, people learn it as Oregon. And that's not the way to say it out here. So that's why, well, see, look, as these, I've learned two things so far today, David. It's Oregon, and when in doubt, blame Wisconsin. So, uh, and apologies to all our friends in the Milwaukee market. Um, David, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your background? Okay, so I've been in uh, TV advertising and media biz for about 20 years now. The first 10 years of that was primarily as an editor, did assistant editing on a feature or two, and then primarily was in uh, advertising world. Uh, about 2010 or so, I started transitioning into doing finishing work, uh, primarily from you know finishing my own edits, and then I took over finishing the other other artists' edits, the other editors' clips, and uh, eventually got Smoke, back when Smoke was on Mac was a brand new thing, and that was my intro into the Autodesk world, and eventually picked up Resolve and now Flame, and so for the last five years I've been about half and half, doing half my work in Resolve and half in Flame, and many of the projects uh, bouncing back and forth between the apps for uh, the same project. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's dive into it. But before I have you share your screen, I just want to remind everybody: if you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A panel. That'll be the easiest way to keep keep track of them. And uh, if you do want to uh, put anything out in the chat, just make sure you have the chat set to uh, all panelists and attendees, so that everybody can see uh, can see the comments. So, David, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, we'll get on. All right. There. Let's do that. Share screen. Desktop. Share. All right, are we are we good here? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, yeah, so we just did my little backstory here about me. 
quick couple of things about Resolve. It was a top of the line grading app in the 2000s. It was acquired by Blackmagic in 2010. In the 2000s, it was like flame. It was a six figure minimum purchase of up to $800,000 for a top of the line Resolve system. Blackmagic acquired it, started using the gaming GPUs and making it a software only product. And it's remained at the top of the heap for a while there, but the uh, development started steering it towards a more general video tool. It added editing features and then visual effects, and now it's even got audio in there. And now their latest version is basically got Final Cut 10 in there. It's got a regular editing page that's like a Premiere or Avid page, and then the exact same timeline can be edited in a Final Cut 10 style. So that's not really my. Uh, interest in it. It's still awesome for color and they're still adding visual effects tools and uh, other things like that. And they're also developing pro video shared workflows where if you have a setup as a server, you can have editors working on a project and colorists and visual effects all working on the same live timeline. Um, I don't know anybody that's actually using it yet because if you're an audio guy, you know Pro Tools and Fusion is their effects tool. Not a lot of people know all that. so. Um, I don't know anybody actually doing it yet, but it shows promise and it shows that they're thinking of the pro market and the thing. It's not just, okay, let's go to the YouTuber crowd. Um, but it does seem like most of their developments are going that way. They want millions of users, not thousands of users. So they do keep up with the, the kind of the bare minimum. You can do ACES, HDR, Dolby Vision. This is the same app. You can do a Atmos mix and a Dolby Vision picture release. So uh, it's pretty wild that one app does all of these things, but it's so strong and uh, has such a good history. Company three still uses it. Uh, Baselight is kind of taken over as far as the higher end workflows, as far as I can tell, but it's still definitely in use. And I'm sure it's the most widely used color app in the world since it's very cheap. Um, now Flame has made great strides in the last few years with its uh, image and effects tab and the new uh, color tools that it has, so why spend any time learning Resolve? Why do you bother with that? Um, Andy mentioned a couple of things. Uh, there's just simple things. I, you can sometimes think of it as a support tool, like sometimes you use Nuke or Synthize or whatever. Think of Resolve as another tool in your kit. It can be XML cleaning, reading new formats, DNGs, or new camera codecs, as Andy mentioned. Resolve is usually the first out of the gate to support anything new that comes out from Sony or Red or anybody like that. Um, so it's another tool for some VFX. I'm gonna show a new time warp algorithm it has. It's pretty awesome. Fusion is built right in. Um, it also has almost all the delivery options you could ever need, DCP, H.265, IMFs, all kinds of other stuff that Flame um, is getting on board with now with their IMFs, but like two years ago, you could export a QuickTime or a DPX or EXR, but not any of those uh, di distribution formats. It has awesome subtitle track support. I've done one project that I did most of the work in Flame, but I needed to add like five different subtitles in Korean and Chinese and all of these kinds of things. And so I just exported a generic popped it over to Resolve and built all the subtitle tracks and exported the final project from there. And it's still an awesome grading app. And since I know it, I've been using it for years, I still find it very, very uh, intuitive and helpful for projects that are primarily grade. Uh, it has killer performance. It's very GPU optimized. They know a lot of people are working on laptops. And even a few years ago, I was able to finish a feature shot on RED 5K with uh, off-the-shelf 2015 iMac before the iMac Pros were around. Uh, and it's got some great tools for client sessions, for showing all your versioning, uh, for grouping clips and filtering, things like that. Um, I think Flame's working, you know, it's getting closer and doing a lot of these kinds of things now, but um, there's still some things in Resolve that I just love. Uh, it's compatible with just about every grading panel that's um, out there, and it's free. So, you know, why not have a free toolkit in your thing? Uh, there's an advanced version that's called Resolve Studio, but even that's only $300. It was 1000 a few years ago when I got it, but my same, I got one of those old school dongles, and uh, the same dongle has worked for like six years now. I've never even had to pay for an upgrade or support or anything. So with the support is, yeah, you get what you pay for, which is nothing. <laughs> so there's a little bit of a 
you know, that kind of a thing. Um, hey, David, um, yeah. actually, I got a first question that came in. Do you happen to know if the if there's parity between the versions? Like, is the Linux version and the Mac and Windows are they all feature uh, identical? Or feature parity? Yes, absolutely. Workflow, all of the buttons are in the same place. There might be a little bit, you know, different thing to set up with the graphics cards, but um, you could, if you look no on one system, it'll look the exact same on all the others. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so I use Resolve in basically three different ways. One is, this is my preferred workflow. I love to, if I have the time and the proper schedule, I love to do a grading pass in Resolve, get the grade approved, move it over to Flame, do my visual effects, conform and deliver from out of there. That's happening less and less these days. I just don't have um, a proper timeline to do a lot of that kind of work. Um, and sometimes I don't even do the grade. It could be anybody else doing the grade and I'll try to do that same workflow, but then there might be one or two reasons to pop over to Resolve for a shot or an export or a subtitle or something like that. So I can use it as a support tool or what I'm often doing now is using Flame, Resolve as my main tool and then using Flame for visual effects. So I'm doing my basic grade and conform and Resolve, but I pop out to Flame uh, to do my effects work. And occasionally you get these crazy projects where I'm just kind of doing this all day long. I uh, did one day. project <laughs> recently for the University of Oregon. Uh, Nike had just built a big museum to the founder of Nike and the track coach there. And there were like 20 different deliverables and it was all sorts of historical footage with, you know, deinterlacing and foot pull down removal and all that stuff. So I brought my flame out to Nike and uh, did the work out there on my system, they were like, oh, no, we, we, we only need you to do color. And I was like, yeah, trust me, you're gonna want flame. And so we wound up finishing like 20 videos and I think like eight of them were out of flame and 12 out of my, out of resolve. <laughs> so uh, all kinds of back and forth is possible. So let's jump into flame and show you a typical uh, example here. So we have this shot, you know, cars driving by, nice, uh, tracking shot there but Beautiful of course, formation. When, we get, when we get the edit uh, the editor has gone to a 38 percent speed warp so it bounces between 200 and then down to 38 and i'm not sure how's the video quality playing back it's uh it, it's better than it was but i think uh yesterday rather um yeah. so i want to uh, i want to thank uh, the majority of of uh the united states for staying off the internet while we do this yeah, thank you very much. Um, Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, so we do a 38% time warp. Obviously, we're going to have all of those repeated frames in the mix mode. So you try up here to do a motion effect and then see how that looks. And you'll see all kinds of crazy warping effects. Oh, yeah. If I go into here, if you look down here in this portion of the, the street and the ground over here, let me do a couple of frame by frame step throughs so you can kind of see how. It's getting really ugly artifacts and I could like, okay, I could rebuild all that in flame with projections and, you know, take a half of a day to redo this. Or I can see if another time warp algorithm is going to give me better results. Uh, I used to be at a ad house full time that had nuke. And so I could pop, I didn't know nuke as a true compositing tool, but I knew enough to get a clip in and try a time warp and render it out and see if that gave me a better result. And I can bring that back into flame and pick and choose. Okay, for this portion over here, we'll use the thing out of nuke or resolve. And then this portion, we'll use the flame and recombine the uh, clip that way instead of trying to stay all in flame. So let's uh, see how we do that. So I brought this in as an edit, as an XML, and it conformed okay. So I didn't have to run it through resolve to begin with. But now if I want to get that over to resolve, um, uh, one other thing, I'm going to save and quit flame each time I go back and forth, but I don't usually have to do that. I can usually just tab over here and switch between whatever, you know, keep them both open. As long as I've turned off the video hardware on one of them, I can have my broadcast monitor outputting flame or resolve, but not both. But um, with Zoom and maybe it's the latest versions of one of these, I don't know, I was crashing when I was trying to do that. So I'm going to save and quit each time I do this. But normally I don't have to do that. Okay. We'll just add so, Zoom. So far we've learned we're blaming Wisconsin and, and we will also add Zoom. Zoom's add, probably uh, the culprit, yeah. We're creating an enemies list today here on Logic Live. 
<laughs> so I'm starting up Resolve. I love these flat, like these launch screens because it's always like, here's someone enjoying like ramen. And by the way, there happens to be a black magic camera, <laughs> you know, in the right. foreground there, product placement. I love it. So I'm going to do a new project here and I'm just going to call this Logic Sunday. So I'll show you starting from total scratch. So we're up here and uh, it's laid out kind of similar to Flame where it has tabs along the bottom here for which uh, mode you're going to be working in. And it's kind of set up in a left to right manner. You start here at the media, you have two different ways to edit now visual effects here in Fusion, color grading here, Fairlight is their audio tool, and then everything gets output over here from the deliver page. Uh, that's a little bit different than, you know, often you can go back to your normal timeline and hit an export button, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so um, like any, you know, editing or visual effects tool here, you're gonna have media browsers, and I like to create my own bins and sort of do my own organization for this. I'm going to just have a timelines bin, and I'm going to have a bin for reference cuts and a bin for sources or however, you know, whatever project you're doing, it'll have different needs over here. But so to do this time warp, I'm going to go here and go right click in the timelines, and I'm going to import an XML. So it's going to pop up here. Here's our tire cars time warp edit. And because uh, this edit, I just built this edit in Premiere, it's going to automatically link to the media because it knows where that media is. But sometimes there might be an extra step in there where you have to uh, point it towards your, your media. Um, and of course, there's a lot of options when you do this. I usually uncheck use sizing information because I usually want to control all that myself. Um, set project settings, it's kind of already set. I'm not sure why it does. I think that means take the setting from the XML. So when I hit okay there, so I've got this guy and it's uh, doing the time warp. If I look at the clip speed here, change clip speed, it came in at roughly 38, same as the uh, other one. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention this was 6K footage. So, of course. It's a, yeah, exactly. So, it's going to look great on Snapchat. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Right. I've, I've had a week. Um, so, we want to add Resolve's time warp and see what kind of uh, effects we're going to get out of here. Well, over here, there's retiming and scaling. This is your little inspector. This is uh, showing you what your selected clip is, like if you put a transform on it and you're zooming. Uh, so we're going to enable the retime and scaling by double clicking it. And so this middle one is the one we're interested in. Retime that to optical flow. Of course it has the same, you know, nearest frame brand and then optical flow. And then in motion estimation, there's a speed warp. And that will uh, do a really high quality. They, they claim it's you know, AI powered, whatever that means. Um, but what's interesting about it is we'll get some pretty good results. Now, one thing that I find really annoying about this is there's not a way to just say, okay, you can't do this in real time, just render it for me. Well, you can't just like hit the render button. What it does is I have my preferences set up on playback to do a render cache in smart. And so this does a little analysis of the power of your system and says, oh, I need to render that before I can play it back. So this little blue line up the blue here line means, means there? the blue line means it's rendered and it's ready to play back. And it's a little squirrely on the timeline page. It actually has better uh, recognition on the color page where if I try to play this back, it's gonna be jumping, this red is saying, oops, I can't, I can't play this back, I need to render it. So it's playing through and rendering it as it comes in. So as soon as this is gonna be done, there it's ready to play back. 
So now let me go into full screen mode here and we can see. So how does it look? Well, if we look over here, it's not perfect. There's a few little wobblies where the shadows cross there, but it's a heck of a lot better. And it might even be good enough to, to fly. Uh, might be a little funny things here with the wheels and stuff like that. But again, this is similar to exactly what I would do in Nuke. I would run it through the Kronos Time Warper and whatever their other one was called and see which, you know, what parts of it worked, what parts of it don't work. That's great. And, and with Resolve, everything kind of has to be in a timeline, right? I mean, yes, you can import yes. a bunch of clips into the Media Hub, but in order, I'm sorry, into the Media, uh, well, Media Hub, but uh, in order to uh, apply effects or do a color grade or anything like that, yeah. you need to put it on a, a timeline. That is exactly right. I'm going to show you one other clip here, my camera original. So here's a clip. I'm just, this is basically just a finder window. I'm pointing to the uh, media on the disc here. And with this particular clip, um, not sure how this is going to show over the streaming, but can you see the flickering that's happening on this character as he sits in front of a computer screen? Mm -hmm. Is that showing up? Yep, I can see it. Okay, cool. So if I wanted to work on this shot, I could drag this in. I would put it in the sources because that's the way I like to organize it. And then if I want to do any effects on this, I can't add effects from here and it doesn't have a batch environment. It does need to be in a timeline. So I would just right click and say, create new timeline using selected clips. And I'll call this Flickr Fixer. And it's gonna put it in the same bin where you're working from. Now, I like to move it into my timelines bin just for myself, my own organization. Oh, and this clip was the source clip from that XML import. So I would personally move that over to here. It does have smart bins over here, like it'll show you every timeline in a project, but especially if you have a lot of versions, it just dumps everything all into one. So on a big commercial job, I'll create sub bins within my timeline bins and so I can organize this, you know, however I want the thirties or the fifteens or the, this spot, that spot. But uh, point being where you need to do the work in a timeline. So for this uh, flicker fixer, I don't have anything to do timing wise or scaling wise in the edit page. I'm just going to go right over to the color page and add um, Resolve has for years now had o OFX support. So there's tons of these open effects that uh, you know have all of your standard add scan lines, stylize, tilt shift, things like that. But one of them that is super groovy for stuff like this is called D-Flicker. So I'm just gonna drag this over here onto the D-Flicker app. And then it has a couple of presets. There's a time-lapse version that's obviously you know, designed for time-lapse or fluorescent light version, different flicker characteristics. And since this one, the, the lines are, if I turn this off, turn off my grading, the uh, lines are within one frame. It's almost like you know zebra stripes rolling up, scan lines rolling up and down his body there. Mm -hmm. So I could turn on, the flicker fixer and it's just magically gone away. Wow. So if I wanted to get really proper about that, I would say, well, the flicker was really only on him, not on her, and there might be some softening going on, etc. So I could do a really quick mat, uh, drawing a mat down here. My mat tool, power window. Uh, oh, sorry. There's a feature here where your window outline is, I usually keep this on only UI, which means if I'm gonna draw a mat here, I see it on my user interface, but not my broadcast output. Gotcha. But with, uh, I'm gonna add some softness there. And so now that effect is only happening on him. Um, I do like to check out, uh, you know, every every compositing app's take on the creation and display of uh, of, of G masks and roto splines and <clears throat> control points and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty decent. I, I prefer flames, but you know, I can I can get by with this one. Um, and so then I will. This is a handheld shot, <clears throat> so I would go over here and track that. But first, what I'm going to do is turn off the D flicker, so it's just tracking the raw footage. 
and I'm just going to go really quick. Wow. All right. So then I'll just turn that back on and then that shot would be good and ready to export. Uh, as soon as I try and hit play, it'll probably tell me render. No, okay, yeah. It's Although it's pretty much keeping up with real time, it's just rendering it as fast as it needs to. Okay, so we have a couple of shots done. We wanna get those back out to flame. Like I said, normally your instincts would be to go back here and try to export something and then you can only export data. <clears throat> you can re-export an XML, you can export all kinds of data from here, but no actual media. All of that happens over here on the deliver page. So back here, anytime you're in Resolve and you're exporting, you have the choice of doing it as a single clip or as individual clips. And you have some different options that happen with that. So for this one, it's just one particular clip. It could go either way, it wouldn't really matter. The re source resolution is the same as my timeline resolution. The only difference would be, does the time code come from the sequence or the source clip? And anytime you're working in single clip mode, it's all gonna be flattened into one clip with time code from the timeline. If I had multiple layers on here, they're all gonna flatten down into whatever, however I've composited it. But if you do individual clips, it will kick out separate files for every shot in there, which is more traditional color grading. And it has a nice little feature here called render at source resolution. So you have 3K footage, you're working in a 1080 timeline, you render that out automatically is exactly um, the source footage resolution so it'll match your raw footage exactly. Now, if you want to do that, there's a couple of little things to, to notice here. Disable sizing and blanking output is helpful. Blanking output is if you're adding a letterboxing on there, and sizing is if you had, you know, this was zoomed in 20% or something like that. If you click that to disable it, it will just come out exactly one-to-one -to, -one to match your raw footage. Maybe you've started compositing in flame on the raw footage and also a great little feature here is add handles and it will automatically add you know, handles on both sides if it has them. Uh, so, so for this one, it could kind of go either way. Um, for the other one I just did, the cars time warp. So we are going to have our options here. We could, you know, this, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm in loop mode. Um, that's the part we were really interested in. So if I wanted to export just that shot, this is my little uh, icons here. I could just say render this clip and it will say in, mark in points and out points for just that clip. Or you could go back here, mark in there and it will add you know as many of the, whatever section of the timeline you want it to be in. So here is one of the weird little uh, gotchas. I'm gonna try to point out, one of the things I find frustrating is like when you're used to one program and you're getting a buy in the other one and there's just one little thing that you're doing wrong, you have no idea where that is and it's just a different way of thinking about you know, how to set up your project or something. So for example, this should say render at source resolution and source frame rate because that's what's gonna happen. It's gonna go back to the real time code and render it out at, uh, like if I just say render this clip, uh, let's not add handles, I'm not worry about that. If I say render this at, I think, um, I wanna make sure I'm putting this in the right place. I'm gonna put that in today's folder. Um, and I'm only gonna render this clip add that to the render queue. So it has this render queue over here where it says, okay, I've got this job you set up and one clip in here. And then you have to go down here and hit the start render button. Okay, so we did this 6K clip in a 1080 timeline and it did uh, took a while to render it as you remember. So if I hit start render, bang, it just did the whole thing in like, two seconds, right? It's like, wait a minute, how did that really work? Did that reprocess all of that footage at that? No. What happened is it's going to render out that clip at 6K. So if you look here, yes, it did it full resolution. And, but if we 
watch it play back. Quick time seven is not really equipped to deal with that. Our slow mo effects are all gone. It disabled all of that time warp effect that we did. So then you could say, okay, well, let's render this out as a single clip. So then it will respect the time warp that we did. And uh, do that timeline name. Uh, and this is going to be the resolution of the timeline. So here, if I add that to uh, the render queue and I start the render, David, you're running this on an iMac Pro, right? Yes, this is a okay. iMac Pro with maxed out RAM and graphics cards. Uh, up here, it tells you a little number how many frames per second it's rendering. So it's not quite real time here. It's four frames per second. That's actually quite a bit away from real time, isn't it? But what we will get is cars time warp edit. Now we have the time warped version. Well, that's okay if we're not doing any other work and we're happy with a 1080 render, but let's say we want to redo that time warp at the full 6K resolution. So you could go custom and type in the resolution here, but you've still done all of the rendering and processing at 1080, so you're just up at the end. So that's not really the right way to do that. So what you'd want to do in that scenario is go back here to your timeline in this and we would say, uh, time, uh, I'm sorry, duplicate timeline. And then I'm going to rename this one instead of copy 6K. And then over here in timeline settings, it was going to default to its normal project resolution, which was 1080. But finally, 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 in the last version of Resolve, you can have multiple timelines. Now I could, in the old version, I could have gone back and changed my entire project to this timeline resolution and it would still render and do that. But now I can do a custom resolution. Uh, let me see if I got these numbers right, 36 for processing. And so now I'm gonna open the 6K timeline and it's going to beach ball me for a minute because it's got a whole bunch of new data it's not used to. And it's going to take a minute to figure out that the resolution is different and it has to re-render all of this. But um, once it does, you could re-render it. And I'm not going to do that now because this render took about 10 minutes to do. But it still looked good. It still had the same uh, resolution, the same quality of the the render. So okay, I'm David, kinda... I'm so glad you showed this because this would have like consumed half of a day for me in oh in, absolutely yeah in various states of uh, of of rage tweeting and you know expletive <laughs> uh, poetry and you know and anger googling yeah that was three hyphenated <laughs> things yeah. So I'm going to switch over to another project where I've done some of the work already. Show you another couple of things here. Okay, so in this project, wait, which project am I in now? Oh, 22, this is the one, sorry. My practice sessions got a little uh, confusing there. Um, okay, so back in the, we're still in the using Resolve as a support tool. Uh, I'm just going to show you that uh, subtitling thing that we talked about. And mm -hmm. before I do that, I'm going to show one other thing here. Um, in your sources, you have the option of adding LUTs here at the media panel. Like so this particular shot we have here is shot on airy, rather flat, but then it gets pretty brightly exposed at the end. If I put an airy LUT on here, bang, now I look at that in my color page where I can see the scopes. So, okay, here, when we get out to here, we're 
Oops, sorry, that's the wrong thing here. Okay, obviously way blown out. Oops, sorry, I didn't reset this project. Okay, that's what I was expecting it to look like. So my highlights are getting clipped and you would think, okay, well, I'm in a, you know, Resolve, it's a professional floating point application and I should be able to just bring those highlights down, but no, they're getting clipped out. And once that LUT is applied back over here, that becomes its new sort of base level of clip. So if I take the LUT off here, but then I put it on here, I like to put the LUT here in the node graph so that I have control over it. I can turn it on and off as needed. And you'll also see, okay, if I take this down, it's still doing that same thing, but what I can do is add a node before there and bring down the LUT before it hits the LUT. So now I'm able to retain all of those highlights and stuff. So just a little gotcha, there's two different ways to add a LUT, but they'll can sometimes yield different results. And really quick, while we're at LUTs, just because I'm trying to point out all of those little gotchas for you, um, let's say we had a custom LUT from the DP, like here's an old project that I had called uh, Joyride, with I had a LUT that provided by the DP. If I want to apply that, I could do it over here, I could do it over there. But the crazy part is, well, how do I get the new LUT in there? I just got an updated one or it's a different project or whatever. And you'd think there would be a way to say, load my custom LUT on here, right? Uh, no, <laughs> there's not. You actually have to go back here into the finder level library, application support, resolve, LUT, and create your own little folder here. If I were to create a new folder here called logic. So now there'd be a folder there that I can access from here. I might need to restart it, I forget. Yeah, probably in the next time I start resolve, it would show up over here. So I don't wanna spend too much time on that right now. So real quick, I wanna show you this other uh, subtitling support. So, Subtitles can be either generated in Resolve and manually typed out or imported. Um, but the cool thing is it also has a bunch of great export features. But if I turn this track on, so now we move this guy away here. And I highlight this so it's like looking at the subtitle track and the subtitle clip. I have this cool little interface here where it tells me all of the subtitles in there and you can jump between any of them and <laughs> type them. Yes, Andy is the best. Um, but what's awesome about this is if you just say use track That's style, <laughs> anytime you change anything in here, you want them bigger, you go back to the other ones, it changes them on all of them. It's, you know, and if the edit changes, you need to slide anything, it's just simply like editing any other little clips on there. Cool. So then, depending on your workflow and your deliverable, okay, I've got subtitles here, how do I export those? Over here, if I go back to the individual uh, single clip mode, there's a whole new panel here called subtitle settings, and it can export them as a separate file. You can burn them into video or as embedded captions. So as a separate file, you have a couple of options here and that will uh, generate the .srt file, that maybe that's part of your deliverable. Um, if your picture is totally finished, you can bring it in here and export a version that burns it over there. Or if you want to bring it back into flame, another thing that I've done is just throw black over it. And then it will just export that as white over black. You put it over here and just say burn into video. And then that will come out at your timeline resolution as a white on black. Um, and of course it can do all the different, you know, if you wanted yellow, you can change that to color, yellow subtitles. So, okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is all of the cool delivery options. Like I said, you can do QuickTime, DCPs, DPXs, uh, IMFs, um, QuickTime, ProRes H.265, and it has even has presets up here for IMF Netflix, 20th Century Fox. Um, and, uh, you know, DCP is something I've had to do quite a few of. And 
it has a pretty great built-in free DCP thing, or it also has easy DCP, which is a little bit of a higher end codec that, uh, you know, the professional DCP people would say, oh, you can't use that cockadoo one, that's bad. You know, it, it works fine. It's, um, I think it's the difference is it doesn't do variable speed or variable uh, data rates. Mm -hmm. It's still pretty, pretty great. Okay, so hey, that's, one, one bit of feedback in the chat here uh, yeah. with regards to updating that list of LUTs. Um, yeah. Apparently in, um, in preferences, there's, uh, there might be a button that will update the list without having to restart. Oh, that's uh, cool. I wanted to make great. sure, make sure everybody uh, heard about that. That is in color not, management settings. Speaking you know. of preferences, I don't want to take too long going through these, but it can drive, it even drives me crazy. I've been using this for at least five years and it seems like every version they move preferences around. So this one I have project settings where all of the different settings for this particular project. And then up over here, there's also preferences for system and user uh, where, you know, I like my thing some way, but then the whole system needs to be set up this way. So um, it can take a while to, I was hunting down something the other day and I was like, Jesus Christ, where do they put that thing? Oh, it was like, how much time does it wait before background caching? And it was like, does that, should that be project specific or system specific, user specific? It took me forever to find it. Um, okay, so that was pretty much how I bounce out to resolve for occasional work like that. If uh, we're doing okay on time, I'm gonna try to show where I work primarily in resolve and then do visual effects in flame and have it seamlessly come back into my conform and resolve without manually importing it. Yeah, go for it. All right. So back in resolve here, I have a project called Boating VFX. And so here is my timeline that I have graded and I have a visual effects shot up here. So the raw footage of this had um, this rope in here they wanted to remove so you didn't see the crew pulling the boat along. And it's all a lie. Also said, can we add some, uh, some branding into this? So this is a spot for Oregon Lottery and to uh, know your limits of problem gambling. And this guy loves gambling so much he has the lottery logo on the boat. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so this, <clears throat> this clip here is kind of like a pattern browsing in Flame. I can have, uh, if I turn this off, I see the original. And if I turn this back on, I can see any of the versions of this that I've done. Like in the first version, I did just the um, rig removal. And then in the second version, I added a logo, but oops, I forgot part of the rig removal. So then I went back and added a third version that cleaned that up. And so you can easily switch back and forth between those versions. And so let's say now I'm here in my color review and the <clears throat> art director or whomever says, you know, I like that, but let's reposition the, the logo a bit, make it a little bigger, and uh, maybe we'll brighten that up a little bit too. So since all this has been set up in advance, I don't have time to go through how to set it all up right now, but that's what that other longer video is all about. I'm going to quit this and go back to flame. And again, usually I just tab right over and I can be right there, but I'm trying to prevent make sure I don't crash today. So playing it safe. Amen. Amen. So I yeah, have the, uh, just, just a reminder to everybody, the link for uh, David's other videos in uh, is in the chat here and I'll put it up on logic.tv with the recording of this. Okay. Okay. So here is where we were before I'm working on a flat pass so that, you know, my grade is going to, work with me and we're also generating a map that we can bring out in there. So um, let's just say we want to do a new version and we're going to make the logo that big and that orientation. So I've iterated up to a version four and now I'm just going to render those guys out.
Busy day on the lake today. Yeah. This woman that's fishing, does she really need to be at anchor that close to shore? That's. <laughs> it doesn't look like a very windy day, does it? <laughs> uh, okay. So I've got my new render here and my new mat here. I just need to get those into Resolve. So the way that Resolve does that is it creates, if you'll look at this file path here, I've created an intermediate renders boat 20, which is what I named this shot. And then Resolve makes this folder structure where it puts the raw footage clip in here and then in the Fusion folder, that's where if you were working in Fusion, it would render to that folder. And so Resolve would look in that folder for a new render from Fusion and pick it up. But it's not really, it doesn't really care where the render came from. If I put version four out here, movie, I'm gonna render that out. Yeah, that's from an old version. So now I've got version four out there, and then I'm also going to export a new map out here for myself. Save that. And now I'll quit and go back to Resolve. Oh, here we go. Look at that. New so splash screen. Resolve advanced panel. Showing the advanced panel, new placement. I would like to work in, in a beautifully graded environment like that. <laughs> that's one of my, that's my new professional goal. With all beautiful people and purple walls. Maybe with just another person. <laughs> Let's start small. <laughs> Uh-oh. I'm blaming Zoom on this one. All right, it looks like we may have frozen up here, or David may have frozen up, so we'll give him uh, a chance to come back in. In the meantime, uh, while we're waiting for David to reconnect, uh, let me give you a little preview as to what's coming up in the future on, uh, on Logic Live. All right, so coming up next week, June 21st, we have Advanced Flame Techniques with Mihran Stepanian. Uh, Mihran, if, uh, if you, have uh, seen or taken any of his FX PhD courses. Mihran is amazing. He is always like pushing the boundaries of, of flame and, uh, and what is possible in between apps. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. So he's gonna be kind of uh, taking us through uh, all of his fantastic workflows. That's gonna be followed by uh, June 28th. Joel Osis is going to join us, the man, the myth, the legend. Definitely looking forward to that. And uh, July 5th, we'll have an interview with Autodesk Stéphane Labrie. That'll be followed on July 12th by Brian Higgins from Flavor in Chicago. July 18th will be another wizard, Andy Davis from LA. July 26th, Naveen Srivastava from, uh, from, oh, wait, David is back. One second, and then I will uh, answer the, the question that everyone is, is wondering, that is where is, does Naveen work? Uh, all right, this is me scanning Zoom to let David back in. Hold on, should be back in. Um. He was in, there we go. One second and here comes David Johns. Um, and then we'll get back to the uh, Logic Live upcoming in a second. David, are you back with us? I'm trying to be. 
It's saying I can't well, start you... video. Saying oh, well, that uh, can... host has it stopped. Oh. Hmm. Let me see if I can share the screen at least. Okay. There we go. Okay. So that's good enough. Welcome I guess back. My... you can't see me, but uh, that's okay. All right. No, so you're with me... us in spirit though, David. Okay. Uh, am I ready to go on or you want to finish up what you're talking about? No, go right ahead. Okay. Welcome back. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here we are back at that um, thing. And this, uh, I wouldn't need to <clears throat> quit and restart. As long as I just hit this little button here to select version, version four would show up automatically. And that's, so I've even had projects where I have other artists working on them and they drop them in there. And then all of a sudden, bang, there I go. I got the, the new bigger logo. because everybody likes the logos bigger. So one other little thing to show is, if I wanted to bring that mat in, here's that mat. I have to tag it as uh, add as a mat. So I'm gonna put my VFX folder up here and then I'm gonna import this, add media pool as a mat. So it's gonna come in with this little icon over here that says, oh, this is a black and white mat. <clears throat> I can use that in the grade later. So for example, back here, um, and this is cool too. So it's reading that raw footage. I have access to all of those versions, all with the live grade on there. And so now if I wanted to add something to control the logo there through the mat, I can go in here and say add map. And then it's going to pull up every clip that I have in the project that's been tagged as a map. So obviously if I do that one, it's going to be the wrong size. But if I do before here, now, when I look at the map, everything I do with that node is going to be graded through. Oops. I asked you to start your video. Okay. Um, and you're back. Is going to be graded through that map. And I believe that works on, I can't remember if that works on time code or frame count, but uh, I think if you, I can't remember. It can be a little, you know, obviously if you're going to time warp this, I don't know if that's going to screw up. <clears throat> the mat. It probably would now that I think about it. But um, okay, so if I have a few more minutes, I want to show you a couple like, so like I said, Flames got really great grading tools now. So why do I still like to grade and resolve? Well, a lot of it has to do with what you can display. Like if I'm going to, you know, be starting a session, I've usually done a first pass, and then I can do a split screen and show a bunch of different versions. So this actually goes out to your client monitor as well. So we can start to look at, you know, version one up here, two or three, and see things in context, in motion. And then um, when I'm going through and grading, I'll do the first pass and then I'll switch over to show me the split screen with neighbor clips. And so this means I'm going to see the clips before and after. And so you can see if something's stick, sticking out, it's like, oh, that's not matching too well. Like for example, oh, this last shot here doesn't look like it matches this guy very well. I'm gonna wanna match those up. So I'm always working on the clip in the bottom left corner. So if I step up there, I now, oops, I'm too far back to see that guy. Then go up here to viewing, split screen, and say selected clips. And now, Anything I click on in the timeline, I can see that. And I'll even play them all back in motion, but more or less for this one, I would say, oh, I want to grade that one. Let's add a new grade here to warm it up and bring that back into line with the other clips. <clears throat> and David, uh, this is two questions for you. Uh, these are, these, this feature here is, is available on the free version as well, right? Yes, yes. I'm not exactly 100% sure which things are on the paid version and which aren't. Most, I mean, there's certain high-end things that I know like stereoscopic and uh, things like that that aren't gonna be in the free version, but most of the tools are in the free version for sure. Some of these um, open effects things are maybe not. Um, in fact, I know some of them aren't. I'll show one that's not. But uh, back in the day, I before uh, <clears throat> Flame was neat video supported, I used to run this as one of my auxiliary things and just run it through neat video, reduce noise, render at source resolution, 
you have a denoise pass to bring into flame that doesn't even need rendering. So that was all pretty great. Um, so a couple little quickie. I'm sorry. Uh, one, the other, the other part of my, uh, the second part of my two-part question there was, is there a way to overlay on top of uh, your your image there, um, like information of of a for each clip? But can it show you uh, like what version you're seeing in that split view? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about the the client who's watching. Um, if you're doing versions, if I'm tabbing between different versions, like if I go to the next version, it pops up a little window there that says V2 is loaded, V3 oh, okay. is loaded. And then down here, it'll tell you which version you're on, version one, two, or three. And you can change what this displays. You can say, show me the codec of this clip, show me the name of the source clip, and just by double clicking, it cycles through those. It also has a pretty robust uh, data burn-in. If you wanna see record timeline, record frame number, uh, I'm not sure why I'm not seeing that. But all of these things can be uh, overlaid as, as burn-in. Source clip name, source file name. Cool. Um, huh, yeah, I'm not sure why it's not showing up. Something with Zoom maybe? I don't know. That's always a possibility. Oh no, I'm probably still in a split screen mode. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. there we go. I was in showing me selected clips, but I only had one clip selected. So now, oops, that's a little too small. So yeah, you can say source file name, source clip name, uh, all kinds of different metadata can be uh, put up here. And then you can either leave this up and then just at the export window, burn it in or not burn it in. So um, turn all of that off for now. And then I got one other little groovy thing to show that is another one of my favorite tools here. And that is one of these uh, open effects clips called a color compressor. I'm gonna move this guy over here again. <clears throat> so if I turn the grade that I have off for this clip, this is a gradient I generated in Flame. And I'll use this quite often when you're supposed to have, you know, branded things where somebody's supposed to be wearing a color that's exactly the right shade of blue for Procter & Gamble or whatever the, the client is like that. So what this does is I can pull a key for anything that's even remotely red or green in this example and make it the exact right green. Like if you look down here in the vector scope, there's some of this is over in the yellowish category and I can just say, no, pull all of that right into the green. Uh, over here, you can control whether you're compressing the hue, the saturation, the luminance, all of those things are, I mean, if you do all three, you're just gonna have a complete flat green, which not particularly useful, but just to show you what the controls are. So each one of these can be, you know, you can have multiple things set up. And uh, I did a job once for Google where they wanted all of their little products in there to be one of the four Google colors. So I just mm -hmm. set that exact color that I was targeting and pulled a key for anything that was reasonably close and the other cool thing that you can do with this is, uh, so this shot is, here's what the raw footage looked like. And the client, this is for Nike, and they had two different people chiming in on the grade, one of whom was the product manager and one of whom was the uh, creative on that. And so creative wanted one kind of look, but that would change the look of the product. Well, what you can do with this color compressor is pull a key from the raw footage and then if I, it has this little thing called target color where it's like what do you want that color to be and sometimes i'll even have people that give me here's your pantone swatch and match this exactly and i can change this so you either have presets or numbers here or even sample like this little Thing, like say we wanted to do this and uh, you want this to be that green, bang, there it's that green. And what's cool about this, let me turn off of that so we can see the green and the, um, we do a different color real quick. Let me do, uh, cancel, turn that back on, sorry. Target color, let's do that fuchsia color. <clears throat> So you'll see that out here in the vector scope. 
that's where that uh, thing is there. And even though I'm feeding it the RGB from the fork, you know, from the grade, I have a node for levels and a grade for color. If I change the levels, it's gonna follow um, the product in it. But the color, if you watch that little vector scope there, I can make this go very warm and it still saves that same color. Now eventually, you know, it gets looking ridiculous and fake. But if you wanted to do subtle, you say you got the product thing dialed in exactly right, and then you want to do subtle grades on the other parts, it's pretty easy to grade that and keep the uh, product dialed in to exactly whatever color you had set up. That's very cool. We've all yeah. been there. Yeah. Right, man. So, and, and you can also grade it after the fact, too. Like it's doing that matching, and then it, you, know, you have a little bit more control if it's starting to look you know, weird for whatever reason. So. That's excellent. David, um, I have one question for you and then I wanted to just uh, put it out there. If anybody does have any questions, please drop them in the Q and A. Um, does Resolve have an internal working color space? Yes, uh, that is gonna be set on a project specific management here. So this were my timeline color space. I was just going with my standard TV workflow here, but it has a bazillion different options for all of that. It has red colors and 2020s and 2100s and all of that kind of stuff. So it can get really, really complicated if you want it to. Um, it's got all these different kinds of ACEs, Airy, Log C. So yes, it does and it, you have input color space, timeline color space, output color space. You can, uh, if you separate those out, you can have different gammas for each one of these. It can, uh, it can get, it's, it's normal default way is to do its own DaVinci space. And then it also has a color managed version and then ACES versions as well. Well, here's another question for you, um, or actually a request. So it would be it would be great to show um, the hue versus curves. I'm not sure oh, yeah. if we have something similar in Flame. That is definitely true. All right, so I'm going to make a new version of this clip really quick, and then we're not going to do any of that uh, uh, color warper thing that we had. Um, the curves section over here. I didn't have time to go through this whole interface. But the curves here has a lot of different kinds of curves. This is like your normal uh, gamma curves. And then if you step over here, it has hue versus hue. So if you wanted to sample the skin tones and change the skin tones, it's gonna say here's your, and then this is obviously your softening to that. But there's a lot of really great, uh, Hue versus saturation, so we wanted to desaturate the skins, keep everything else. This isn't a particularly colorful shot, but um, actually let me switch back to that other timeline really quick to show that. Like, you know, say we wanted to manipulate the color of this vest, um, add a node here, and then hue versus sat, we want to desaturate this purple. You just grab that and then you have a nice, I almost always add extra softening to it. But there's that, there's also hue versus luminance, there's hue loom versus sat and sat versus sat. And I will actually often fairly, you know, use these luminance things to say, I'm gonna make sure everything that's supposed to be black is black. So I'll pull this down to where if it's anywhere approaching black, it's not going to have a slight red shift or anything like that. It just desaturates everything that falls off to black and or white. You can do the same with the white at the high end there. And same with uh, sat versus sat. You can say have things that are, you know, highly saturated, maintain their thing and do a, a you know, quick, uh, what was that movie that did all that with the black and white characters? Oh, uh, First one that did that. Sin City? No, I forget. Uh, some sort of fantasy thing, but uh, yeah. So these curves are great. The Pleasantville. interface does. Yes, <laughs> Pleasantville. That was the one I was thinking of. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it does take. I mean, I could do a whole afternoon in in the interface. What I 
as a flame artist, I love having everything up here in a uh, graph and being able to find all of that, but that's just not the way Resolve set up. It has like a key for this. Every, I mean, the interesting thing is every particular node can be everything. It's not like this node is a key puller or a, a blur. You can add a key to that node by just sampling it here. You can add a window to it by adding thing. Now this thing is only affecting what's in the window. Um, it has the, the tracking for the window. You can add, you know, blurs and everything, blurs and sharpenings all within an operation. So every operation is the whole toolkit all in one. So it can take a little bit of getting used to as far as like developing what workflow you like to do. I generally like to do one operation per node so that if it's, you know, pretty easy to say, okay, I want to affect the levels or the color um, and keep yourself organized that way. And then taking just the extra little five minutes or five seconds really to label it, node label on here, best color. So when you and, pick uh, it Jeff, for a revision, you're not starting from scratch trying to re reverse engineer your own work. Uh, Jeff in the chat here said that there is a matchbox. Um, can't remember the name of it, but there is a matchbox uh, that, that gives some of the uh, hue versus hue, hue versus sat feature features in, in flame. Um, yeah, there's the color yeah, curve and I like that in theory, but it's, it's, it has weird issues like that. I can never do a slight adjustment. It pops it up to at least like 5% of a thing. So I wound up having to build a comp and mix it back and stuff like that. Uh, and Neil in, in, uh, in the Q and A here had a question. I think I, I, I got it here. It's like, let's say you did a grade. Uh, well, I guess it's if you had two different versions, like two different grades. Yes. Uh, how would you apply uh, the like version two before exporting? So if you had a, if you had a look and you, and you wanted to mm. export both versions, how would you do that? Um, you can, like say this clip. I have three different versions built for this. And if I go to my deliver page, it will, I, well, how do I do that? It's been a while since I've done it this way. Uh, okay, I gotta do individual clips. And then there's a weirdly named setting called use commercial workflow. And let me see if I can remember where that is. Place clips and stuff are full. Oh, there it is. A okay, further down. commercial workflow. This will uh, actually generate all of the versions. So if I say use version name for folders, and I add that shot to the render queue. Oops, should I added all of the clips. Let me do just that one. Render this clip. Um, source name, clips in separate folders. Add to render queue. I think this should do all of the versions. Yeah, you see it's doing three passes. So then over here at your export level, you would have had, <clears throat> well, this is a kind of a weird um, quirk in it. It puts version one in a folder based on its time code names. And so that was version one. And then version two and version three are up here in separate folders because they're with QuickTimes, they can't have the same folder, I mean the same file name, obviously. So its solution to that is to make a little separate folder for it. But yeah, if you, for whatever reason, need to do multiple passes and render out multiple passes, it's uh, <clears throat> use commercial workflow. I'm gonna start using that all the time, not in Resolve, but like when I'm bidding jobs. You know, well, I'll be using the commercial workflow today. <laughs> yes. uh, you know, maybe we can get an extra few shekels uh, for the job. Uh, is there a high quality resize function or is there a preference for resize? Yes, there is. It has a lot of different uh, scaling options, retiming and scaling. If you look at scaling, it has your um, method, whether or not you want to crop, fit, fill, or stretch. The namings are slightly different than flame. And then the resizing filter has sharper, smoother, by cubic and by linear. And I just saw um, there's something in this new version they call a super scale, which that's got to be great. 
It's got to be. It's, you know, up res it to it's 8K, super. right? Yeah. Um, I don't, I haven't really um, investigated that yet, but it might actually be over here. I think it was, you know, designed for you have an HD or an SD shot in your um, 4K project. I think it was somewhere in clip attributes. So, um, someone from the chat is saying it's in clip attributes. Yeah, okay. So well, here's clip is. attributes. Here it is, super scale. And it will, you know, double, triple, quad. And uh, let's see if we up that to 4K, sharpness and noise reduction. I haven't played around with this much to see what it is, but even just the normal sharper scaling has worked as well as the flame upscaling for me. Well, I'm going to be combining the commercial workflow with super scale and, and uh, just blow my competition right out of the water. A <laughs> <laughs> um, couple more questions for you. Can you sure. save render queue presets? Yes. Uh, over here in the render queue, in, like I have a Nike WWC preset that I made, and it also has any presets like my normal workflow, my preferred thing is source resolution with handles. So I can just pop that up and then it automatically does individual clips, pro res with 48 frame handles, disables the sizing. Um, there's probably a a uh, couple other settings there. I usually turn off the rendered cache images just because, oh, here's cool. something clever about Resolve, is that you can have your, uh, it also has a proxy workflow, they call it optimized media. And your normal default way of like, say you had 6K footage, you made a 1080 version in order to be able to work quicker. When you go back to the render page and hit render, it automatically assumes you wanna go back to the high res uh, you have to manually force it to say use the optimized media and use the pre-rendered medias. So it uh, it's pretty uh, great. And well, I'd say it's pretty great. It's just something to be aware of. You know, if you want the option of using that, it can be slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, another question from Jeff here. Can you speak at all on the subject of remote versions and how it could possibly compare to the connected conform workflow? When it comes to color yes. grading and resolve. Yes, there are, um, let's see what I can bring in here to demonstrate that. What else do I have here? Um, probably, let me get up, up here, two color. Okay, I'm gonna bring in a clip here. Come on, didn't mean to bring that in, sources. Is that here? Okay, so if I have new timeline using selected clips, I'm gonna make this yoga. And I'm gonna duplicate this real quick. Duplicate timeline. Yoga. <clears throat> um, if I am going to use the same source material in multiple timelines, there's a way to do, uh, it defaults to local versions, meaning each clip's grade is um, unique to that particular instance. Whereas if you say use remote grades, every time this clip appears in the project, it will absorb your latest grade. So if you change it in one, it will automatically update in the other. Let me see if I have, let I me have a better example here with the, um, boating project here. Uh, let me duplicate this. Come on, rename. Ah. Okay, well, let's just say this is the 15 second version and it's, we're gonna take all of those out. So if I were to go to the main, sorry, the uh, interface is right over the place where I need to switch the timelines. If I was using That's this definitely job, fault. Yeah, in remote versions, um, it when I, and I make a change on the 30, it will automatically update in the 15. Now, because I had this set up just with the local versions, there is a way to say, copy to a uh, version. Okay, copy, wait a minute, local versions. There is a, there we go, I'm sorry, copy local grades to remote. 
Okay. So if I do that, now all of these are going to be remote grades. And you see this little pink icon here means this came from the sor same source footage. And so now any um, effect that I do, I'm going to make that there, it shows up immediately in not just all of these clips, but also in the cut down. But it's not showing up yet because it's not using the uh, remote version. Um, can I load that one? There's load. Yeah, okay. It knows this was my source clip, so it automatically absorbs that grade. So then even if I grade it over here in the 15, make it green, and I come back here to my original one, all of those are going to be green. Cool. So what I'll often do is start setting up a project with remote grades. And then once I'm down into the fine tuning, I'll copy all of those over to the local grades so that then you can fine tune individual things. Maybe the shot before or after is different. And so the grade is you know, too much of a jump or something like that. Uh, but it's pretty great if I did this and had a time warp in one of them and in the other, even if I was tracking across that, it will time warp with the tracking and everything will, uh, will still work. Cool. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions for David? All right. Anything else? I think that's it for now, man. All right. This was phenomenal, David. Thank you so much. Great. I, uh, sorry if everything seemed rushed. There's just so much to get through in a short amount of time. If anybody has any further questions, I'm currently not booked this week. So if you want to shoot me a ping, we could even do screen sharing. I'd be happy to show you more or answer your own. If you want to share your resolve screen and show me a trouble you're having, I'm totally open to that. Just ping me through my uh, Facebook. You can find me there in the logic group. Perfect. David, thank you very much. Um, let me switch uh, over to my screen here and we'll close out for the day. Okay. All right. First in, uh, in, sh in the chat, I put a registration link for next week's episode with Mithran um, to pick up where I left off with upcoming Logic Live sessions. Uh, Naveen it works for the Vanity in Toronto. Uh, I know you were all waiting uh, for that one. Bated breath. And then coming up in August, we're already starting to line up some sessions for August. We're going to interview Fred from Autodesk on August 2nd. And August 9th, we have Randy McEntee also from Chicago. Uh, and we have a bunch more of exciting announcements to make for uh, Logic Live coming up. So stay tuned for all of that. Uh, this episode will be up on Logic.tv as soon as I can get it up there. But uh, all the previous episodes of Logic Live are up on Logic TV, including a bunch of other great content. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get those numbers up as high as we can. We would totally appreciate that. And of course, thank you to Synesis Oceana for sponsoring Logic Live. Solutions, integration, and support for digital content creators. Find out all about them at Synesis.io. Synesis Oceana, supporting flame artists since 1997. Well, that's going to do it for this week, everybody. I want to thank you all for tuning in. And a huge thanks to David Johns for uh, taking us through Resolve. And that's it, everybody. We will see you next week.